Welcome to this session on pedagogy for effective use of ICT in engineering education. I am Sridhar Iyer and I am one of the co-instructors of this workshop. So, in this session we will be looking at this question of how to use visualization for teaching learning of scientific content. Okay, to begin with since we have been talking about learning objectives all of yesterday and part of today, uh, the key learning objectives for this session are that after this session you will be able to list different categories of visualizations and you will be able to choose appropriate visualization for your topic and your learning objective. Okay. So, these are the objectives for this session and with that let us begin with looking at a few visualizations which I am now going to do through the screen share function. Okay. So, here is a visualization of something from molecular and cell biology. Okay. So, what you need to do is simply observe what all interactions happen and later on we will discuss about what is the use of this visualization. So, there is a model for DNA replication and there is how the DNA replication happens and how the transcription happens. I am just going to click on one of them and let us say we look at what is the dispersive model and we find that there is a, a flash animation that is loading which shows a DNA strand which is the original parent molecule and there is there is some audio along with it which I have actually currently turned off and the original molecule is replicating in some manner generating first generation daughter molecules and then replicates one more time to generate another generation of daughter molecules and then that part of the visualization ends with some commentary on what is to be observed and then it goes on to talking about the next uh, type of model which is the semi conservative model and so on and so forth. And then there are sessions which talk about how the replication actually happens. It starts with some strands and let me speed it up a little bit and then we will see that at some point different structures are being pointed out and some movement happens and at the end of it you have some replication of the DNA that is being shown. Okay, so, this is one visualization we will just stop here this one we will and it says at the end that in this learning object you have learnt about proposed models for DNA replication how the replication happens and how the transcription happens. Okay, so, that is one of the visualizations that we have seen which is the functions of the DNA. Then it is not essential for you to observe the content of the visualization as much as the features of what is being shown in the visualization. Okay, so, let us look at the second one. Okay. So, here is another visualization which is from uh, microfluidics and turbulence it is about ensemble averaging for unsteady flows and this again if you look at it it starts with the definition of what is a steady flow followed by a graph which describes a steady flow and then what is a turbulent flow followed by its corresponding graph and then if you play it till the end it gives you the average characteristic equation in a steady turbulent flow as some limit of something so on and so forth. Okay. And if you go to the next section once again there is a similar graph for what is an unsteady flow and if we fast forward this unsteady flow again at the end of it we come to the equation for how the average takes place. And then in the third section is where we find the procedure for the ensemble average being given which is over a average over a bunch of 10 experiments in this case which are being shown and just wait for it to play out it takes a value of 6 and then finds the points of the various graphs. And then it gives the general formula which is the formula for finding this average. And at the end of this visualization 
what we have is another set of experiments which is slightly different in which we find that you know there is this slider bar where the user can actually set this value of t and then the user can also set the value of the number of experiments and then the user can say okay start the number of experiments and at some point be able to generate this average values based on the equation. Okay. We are seeing three different sets of visualizations for those who have not been able to see it uh, let me just uh, summarize after seeing this last one maybe you will be able to see this last one. In this last one once again there is a it is a robotics visualization with a 2 hour manipulator simulation and we find that there are these various slider bars which control different things. For example, the length of link L1 is being controlled by this bar or we can also control it by you know control the angle by changing the clicking on the link itself or we can control the length of link L2 which essentially totally defines what is the space in which this manipulator can operate. Then there is the notion of uh, different angles that can be turned around. Okay, so, we can either manipulate this using these slider bars or by directly clicking on the links themselves. Okay. So, essentially what we are trying to see here is that in the first visualization it was essentially we were looking at the visualization itself and more or less passively absorbing the content. Okay. The second visualization there was a lot of the description from the visualization at the same time there was some amount of control which was given to the user in terms of setting the variables and in terms of uh, setting the number of experiments. And in the third visualization we had a lot of control in the user's hand in order to set the different angles and the different lengths of the uh, manipulator. So, there is a question about shall we see the visualization or listen to the talk. Okay, so, I think it is time to listen to the talk now. Essentially, I have summarized what we have seen in these three visualizations. We, have, we are not really required to understand any of the content in that visualization. What we are focusing on is what is the purpose, what are they using this visualization for. So, in order to get to that point, let us ask one question. So, having seen these three examples, let us individually list three purposes of using visualizations. So, this is not yet time to share anything on the chat window. So, individually let us say you are going to show a visualization in your course. So, list three purposes of using visualizations what might be three reasons why we want to use visualizations. Okay, if you have thought of three purposes as you can predict the next phase is going to be a pair phase where we talk with your neighbor and discuss some commonalities and differences. Okay, so, you would have come up with three purposes and your neighbor may have come up with the same or different purposes. Okay, so, what are these commonalities and differences? So, together you should now have about five purposes. Okay, some of you are still sending me responses in the chat window saying understand the concept understand. So, as you saw in the earlier sessions the verb understand is, is itself quite complicated to interpret. So, you need to be a little more precise about what do we mean by better understanding, better understanding of what for what purpose. So, it is not enough to simply say that it will make the concept easy to understand what about the concept what for what purpose can we use visualizations. Okay. <clears throat> so, the more specific and precise you try to write your answer the more you will be able to identify in your own teaching learning when you want to use visualizations and when you do not want to use visualizations. We simply say that okay, I want to have students interest it is too broad a sentence where interest can range anything from engaging with the subject to simply grabbing their attention. Okay, there are some centers which are actually have hit upon the correct direction okay, in terms of they are able to say that you know we are able to provide realistic view of the object. So, you want to be thinking along those lines you know there are 
many uh, many of the responses that are coming in now are quite appropriate effects of variation of variables okay so let's go to share phase since many of you have already progressed to the share phase and are already sharing your top reasons okay so if you look at the chat window essentially the responses are falling into two categories okay one set of responses are extremely abstract which are simply at the level of still at the level of understand better or reduce complexity of the problem okay which you need to now move away from those type of responses and there is another cat category of responses which are more specific which are talking about like like for example here retains the attention of the students in the class increase the involvement of the students okay create impact for specific topics then to identify the fault location using the data flow so the type of answers that we are looking for are the specific answers which are beyond simply saying that it will engage the student or it will help the student understand or it will make the subject easy okay the attempt of every teachers every attempt is to make the subject easy so the question is how is it that you are going to use the visualization to do that to explain the principle of operation exploration inference reduce the complexity of the problem parameter variation is possible so there are now for example goa college of engineering has got it right in terms of saying that parameter variation is possible to show the packet transmission using different packet size bandwidth and links again this is sdm college darbad visualizations mimic the behavior of the actual object yes these are the type of reasons that you are expected to come up with it creates interest among students see the effect of a system by varying the internal parameters of the system save the time to explain a big concept that's again a useful one explain different network configurations can simulate real life situation visualization is much more than text so having done this okay we have not gone for an entire of 10 uh, minutes as we have listed as i had originally planned in this let's move on to talk about some of the key reasons increases imagination capability that's also a good reason which is there from uv patel college of engineering let me go on to the next slide and try to see if we have covered all of these points okay so the use of visuals in educational context now what do we mean by a visualization we have actually left that question somewhat open we have not made a big distinction between a video or an animation or a simulation get but essentially what we find is the use of visuals in educational context we want to be able to when we say that we want to simplify the subject or may help the student learn complex things in a simple manner essentially what we are talking about is to facilitate the students to grasp one of these points okay so in the most simple case or the most usual case it is the making of invisible visible okay so that's one key purpose of visualizations for example when we want to look at how atoms behave in let's say magnetic property that you are studying okay or fields these are things that are not visible and they are also not easy to imagine and a visualization helps in these cases to make the invisible visible also for the internal structure of a machine so when we want to look at the internal structure of a machine once again the visualization helps to look at what is the internal structure of a machine which would otherwise be difficult to uh, to for the teacher to explain as well as for the student to imagine so making the invisible visible is a big reason for the use of visualizations the other big category is when we want to talk about movement of objects or components when we want to say okay suppose like the typical car uh, and road type of simulations in physics where you want them to be able to visualize okay what is happening 
as the acceleration increases or as some other activity or as some collision takes place and so on. So, movement of objects is another area. So, movement of objects over time or over space how the location changes so as a function of time or as a function of space these are two again uh, reasons why we use visualizations because these again are difficult for us to simply do it in our own minds. Okay. The third big category is which is related to the second category itself is the trajectory of movement when you want to plot the trajectory of movement or when you want to make it explicit that this is how the movement happens. Okay. So, if you look at these three reasons and if we go back to the visualization of you know let us say the DNA visualization you find that the DNA visualization falls in this category you know it makes the invisible visible right. And you find that robotics visualization actually comes in this category of movement of objects and the trajectory of movement okay. While the ensemble visualization comes in this category of making the multiple steps in a process or a procedure making it explicit because it had multiple steps and each of the steps were being shown one after another how that average was being calculated. Okay, so, making multiple steps in a procedure now in this case it was a mathematical procedure whereas, you might have a different procedure for example, how to carry out a, an experiment or you might have a procedure of how to assemble some component. So, any of these procedures which have multiple steps once again visualizations are a useful way of communicating them. Okay. Many of us are familiar with looking at you know how to videos on YouTube for doing something by ourselves right. So, when you want to do something by yourself you usually go to YouTube look at how to video and you are able to assemble that. So, that that category of visualizations falls in this category of using the visualization to make the multiple steps explicit. Okay. And the last category which we have not which we have also seen in this um, in the robotic simulation is it facilitates what if experimentation scenarios. Okay. What is the meaning of this what if experimentation? It essentially means that it facilitates the student to ask a question saying what happens if I set this value to some x which was not intended by the teacher and then run the visualization and the visualization simply follows the laws and computes the answer or displays the answer either way depending upon what, what type of visualization it is. And the student is able to see what happens if I were to set it in the manner that they desired. Okay. So, these are the what if experiment scenarios and these are actually one of the most powerful ways in which we can use visualizations for teaching learning of science content where you can create visualizations ask students to set them to certain values allow them to play with different values observe what happens make a prediction what might happen when they set it to a particular value. So, all of these you know science processes are enabled by the use of such visualizations which have this facility where the student can themselves set these values. Okay. So, having said that what we are going to do in today's session is look at two types of visualizations. Okay. One is called a transformational visualization which basically shows changes in an object over time or space. For example, an animation of a weather cycle or a video showing how to operate an equipment. The other type of visualization is what is called an interpretive visualization which illustrates a theory or a principle. So, here again a diagram of an equipment for example, even a static diagram does qualify as a visualization when you have a schematic it is also a visualization or you have an animation of molecular movement that again is an interpretive visualization. So, this is just to give you some background of the theory I mean we are not expecting you to be able to remember whether you are using a transformational or interpretive visualization what is more important is to be able to identify what purpose you want to use a visualization in your course. So, with that let us look at a couple of more motion graphics okay. let us now not talk about static visualizations we will talk about the differences between these video and animation. So, let me click on one of these videos. So, here is a visualization of a reaction between iodine and zinc 
and essentially it shows all the components it says okay water powdered zinc iodine is there there is a dish in which the mixing is going to happen there is somebody who is wearing gloves and is taking some some of the iodine into the dish okay as you watch this visualization what you need to think about is when would you need a visualization of this type which is essentially a video of somebody doing an experiment. You can also see that some mixing is going on with different types of tools are being shown. And then there is a line also there is also a a subtitle which says they are carefully mixed. So, the notion of carefully is also being illustrated using this visualization you know, how the mixing should take place is like being done very carefully and this actually would be a good time. So, if you were a chemistry teacher this would actually be a very good time to pause the video and ask your student what will happen when we put a drop of water. So, I am going to pause the video and let you think about it for a moment what will happen when you put a drop of water ok you have to go back to your chemistry 101 and remember what is going to happen. So, this is one power of the visualization you, know, you could show part of it pause it and ask the student. So, this can be done in any type of visualization it can even be even be done in a program you can run a program you can pause it at some point and you can ask the students to predict what is going to happen at this point ok. So, I am going to continue playing with the visualization. So, when we play it puts a drop of water it is probably going to explode right or catch fire all right. So, some iodine fumes are being generated ok. So, once again you can use the visualization to show that you know what is the amount of how the reaction actually takes place. So, the and then there is a subscript which says the heat generated by this is exothermic causes excess iodine to do this purple smoke is iodine in its gaseous state. And such a visualization helps students to actually get a feel for what the experiment is about even though they have not done the experiment themselves all right. So, that is one type of visualization what we just saw was a video. Okay. So, now what we are doing right now is trying to make a distinction between videos and animations. Okay. So, let us look at an animation next. Okay, so, this is an animation of a distillation column again you first see the distillation column itself and then it the image kind of fades away to show you what is there inside there are labels which show what are the various items there are arrows which show the direction of air and the direction of whatever product that emerges. Then there is the possibility of zooming in into the visualization to look at the different levels more carefully and then it starts off with looking at the topmost level where there is some feed is happening which are filled into one of the levels of the distillation column and then the animation actually shows you how some overflow happens into the next level and how the process of this distillation takes place from one level to the other here once again we find that this is a type of visualization where we are able to go inside the machine to see what is happening right. And once again you find that some higher boiling point component is there at the bottom which is eventually taken out ok there was a notion of dome condensation happening at some level and there is a lower boiling point component which is taken out by a different valve.
and there are arrows which are indicating you know what is happening at the various stages. There is a zoom in view of the process at each of the stages. Okay, so, what we have seen are two types of motion graphics both of these are called motion graphics. In one case we saw a video of an experiment being performed okay, it had its advantages of why we should take a video and in another case we saw an animation of the internals of a particular machine. So, what we want to do now is to think about when is which of these two types appropriate. So, let us say that we have two groups of people in each center this is also a good activity to perform uh, immediately after lunch. Okay, so, while people are kind of falling asleep this is a good time to talk to your uh, colleagues and look at okay, group A is the video group. So, essentially they have to be pro video they have to say okay, these are the advantages of video and group B is the animation group and they have to kind of come up with reasons for why the animation is a good idea. Okay, so, form two groups and participants in each group for about 5 minutes list the advantages for the type of visualization assigned to your group and also list the limitations for the type of visualization assigned to the other group. Essentially, if you belong in the video group you want to say these are 5 advantages of video and these are 5 disadvantages of animation okay. and if you belong in the animation group you have to do 5 advantages of animation and 5 disadvantages of video. So, you do not need to do this as an individual activity you can do it as a group activity. So, I am not asking for responses of the type video is a lot better than animation there is a specific activity that has been assigned okay. the activity is if you are in the group. So, make two groups in your remote center one is the video group and the other is the animation group. Okay. So, the video group has to list advantages for video and disadvantages of animation. The animation group has to list the advantages of animation and the disadvantages of video. Okay. So, please go ahead with this debate in your own centers. So, clearly there are two camps of people because I have got responses which says video is better than animation and I have got the opposite response which says animation is better than video and this is precisely the point where a debate is a useful teaching learning tool. So, whenever you find that there are such responses which are possible in your class always you should think of having a debate between the two. The idea of the debate being that the advantages and disadvantages become more clear in everybody's minds at that point. So, I still find that there are some centers which are sending responses of the type animation is better video is better. So, I encourage you to write the reason why you think it is better because as you would have seen from the other responses there are reasons when a video is better and there are reasons when an animation is better. So, that the whole purpose of this debate is to become clear about those reasons. So, now most of the centers are along the right track because many of them are saying that concept can be explained through animation video is gives the real time feel okay, video also helps to look at the real view okay, limitation of an animation is economic viability somebody is saying animation is time consuming and requires expertise to create. So, these are all good reasons which are now coming out when we start thinking a little beyond which is better in, in the totally abstract sense. Okay, video can run on any platform animation takes less time to explain things that itself is a is an item which we can debate on. Animations can be interactive you want to say things some responses when to use a video, when to use an animation, working principle of motor can be shown by video. 
Okay, so now I am getting a lot of good responses from pretty much almost all the centers and they are kind of along similar lines creating animation itself is one of the learning process. So, that is a very good one. So, which is when you assign creation of the animation to your student as an activity. Okay, if you ask your students to create the animation of the distillation column you can be sure that by the end they will know how that column works. Right? How, however, it still remains to be seen how you are going to assess it and how many marks you are going to assign for it all those issues will remain. Okay, videos help in internal details are not possible in a video. Okay. So, I think we have more or less covered the reasons that need to emerge. So, we have already done this step of communicating the top advantages and limitation via the AVU chat and I have already been reading out some of them. So, largely I think it is more or less the summary is pretty much identical to what we have here as a summary. Most of the responses does fall into this category of saying that the video captures realistic visuals in this and it also helps you to see how to carry out the procedure. While the video cannot capture magnification, position, internal details and so on. The animation on the other hand is useful to show visuals which are not possible to be captured by cameras such as how the internal process of something takes place. On the other hand there is the problem of an animation is that it looks artificial you one does not know whether to you know believe that whether that process will actually take place in the same way in real life or not. right? So, again there are uh, responses which are saying that in animation there are no chemical or physical hazards that is a very big reason for this entire area of virtual laboratories and remote laboratories and so on of controlling being able to control the physical and uh, you know chemical hazards. Okay. So, given this videos and animations let us look at one more category which is a simulation. I am sure most of you are familiar with this idea of a simulation. This is going to quickly share the screen of a simulation which actually is about image thresholding and if you cannot see the simulation it really does not matter because you can imagine any simulation that you have seen earlier maybe using you know your own in your own field using MATLAB or Okay, so, in this particular simulation in one case it simply shows the what happens to an image when you do a image thresholding at a certain point and in the other case I am just looking for huh. and in the other case it looks at suppose I want to do some medium thresholding how the thresholding image looks if I want to do a low thresholding how the image looks or if I want to do high thresholding how the image looks. Okay, so, this is one example of why we are calling this a simulation is that this is more or less uh, there are equations which are governing the generation of the image in the background. So, you might have come across other simulations which are done using specific simulation software. For example, if you are in CS and you are teaching networking you might have used some network simulators which simulate the uh, movement of packets in a network or if you are in electrical engineering or any of the other disciplines also you might have used MATLAB quite often or you might have used some kind of uh, uh, CAD packages or FEM packages. So, they are all essentially going to perform simulation based on some equations underlying the concept that you are trying to simulate. Okay, so, now the key question that we want to understand is when should we go for each of these types. Okay, is it always better to go for a simulation since it seems to be the most you know high end so to speak because it can actually simulate every instance it can always always the equation is very realistic or is it enough to show a video which is mostly passive where the student is just observing it that is the question that we want to now answer. Okay. So, the simulation essentially the same point is being made here using simulation a quality could be added and simulation. So, that is some of the uh, reasons that I am seeing in the chat window they are also quite appropriate that simulations are very accurate. Okay. So, simulations are not only accurate 
they could also provide control to change parameters and display the results. Okay, so, now suppose we leave aside this terminology of am I going to call it a video, am I going to call it an animation, am I going to call it a simulation. So, many people get stuck in this terminology. Okay. So, suppose we do not worry about the terminology and we worry about the purpose, you know, what am I going to use it for, what is the purpose that I want to use it for. And we need a way of making a decision. Okay. So, how would we go about making this decision? I okay, will give everybody a minute to think. How will you decide when you will show a video or when will you go for a simulation? So, here is an example. Uh, Let us say there is a topic of packet transfer which is in computer science and let us say there are three different types of visualizations to teach this concept. Essentially, it shows how data communication is happening, how packet transfer happens. So, when you say play, it starts with showing this number of packets which are 0, 1, 2 here and then one packet is sent and then the acknowledgement is received and then the next packet is being sent and then the acknowledgement for the next packet is being received and then the next packet is being sent and the acknowledgement has not yet been received. I think the animation ends before the acknowledgement is received. Okay. So, this is another, so even if we click on next, it essentially is going to play the same animation again. So, it essentially illustrates how packets are transferred between a sender and a receiver by sending a packet from here and an acknowledgement from there. Okay. So, here is again a similar uh, animation of the same idea of packet transfer between two computers and but here you find that there are many variables that you can manipulate. So, there is something called a sequence number which you can set to let us say 12, there is a window size which you can set to let us say 6 and then you can say I want to do some kind of a run and then you see some acknowledgements being sent, some packets being sent. Essentially, it is the same idea between a sender and a receiver, some packets are being sent, some acknowledgements are being sent, except in the first case, it was a totally static simulation, where all that you could do was say rewind and you could say play and it would just play, the animation would just play. Whereas, in the second case, you as the, you, as the learner or the user have a lot of control on what, what the parameters are and the system is actually showing here in this window as to what exactly is happening behind the scenes when these packets are being delivered and the acknowledgements are being lost and so on. So, now when you look at this one, this essentially talks about how is a file being sent from one computer to another. So once again it says okay, a file is broken into packets and then the packets are then labeled and then they are sent over the network from along perhaps along different paths. They arrive at the receiver perhaps in a different order and then at each point essentially as a user you are clicking this next button, you are observing what has happened and you are clicking this next button and it says okay, this is the next step in the process that is happening. So, packets have arrived, information is reassembled and then that is the end of that visualization. So, now the point is that we have seen three different visualizations for the same concept. So, whenever we talk about packet transfer, we are talking about some one of these concepts, right. So, which of these visualizations will you use? Which is the best one? You know, often we think in terms of okay, I want video is better than animation for the or animation is better than video. So, in that sense, which visualization is better than the other one? So, if we think about that question, some I see some centers actually sending me responses of C and B and so on. Maybe I should have had a polling question on this A, B, C. So, I am seeing a lot of these responses. So, once again the point here is that this question is by itself does not make sense. Okay, which is the better visualization is not a meaningful question 
unless you say for what purpose. So, unless you know what is the purpose, suppose my purpose is simply to illustrate that this is what happens, this is how the packet goes and the acknowledgement. So, there is the notion of a packet and there is the notion of an acknowledgement. If my purpose is only so much, if that is all I want the learner to be able to um, comprehend at the comprehend level, okay, if it is only at the explain what happens in a network, the first visual visualization A itself is enough. If I want the learner to go beyond that and to be able to say okay, what is the exact equation that is underlying this flow between the sender and the receiver, then visualization A is not enough, I need to move on to visualization B. Okay. And if I want the learner to understand okay, what is going on at the TCP level versus what is going on at the IP level, then once again visualization B is not enough, I need to also talk about visualization C. So, the point here is that simply asking which visualization is better is not a valid question. We need to think about which visualization is better for what purpose. So, the key here is to be able to match the purpose and the visualization. So, if that makes sense, there is a simple tool that we can use to choose the appropriate visualization for your topic. Okay. So, given any topic, let us say topic in this sense is topic along with a learning objective. Okay. The topic can be packet transfer and the learning objective can be that I want students to be able to show or draw a diagram of how packet transfer happens between two between a sender and a receiver. There is a good reference that we can use. So, we will just quickly look at some of the key ideas in this. Okay. This is called the Weiss graph. So, the spelling is W E I S S, but you can remember it as W I S E. So, it is a Weiss graph, it will help you to choose wisely about which visualization to use. Okay. So, it it is a very simple way of deciding. So, in the beginning it says okay, let me look at is there trajectory and movement inherent in the topic. Okay. So, if there is no movement or there is no trajectory involved in the topic it turns out that you may not need any animation, you may not need any visualization at all. So, the first question you want to ask is, is there movement or is there anything that is going to change as a function of place or as a function of time. So, if there is no change, then perhaps you do not need a visualization. Even in this case, if you think that maybe I want to do some cosmetics or I want to simply grab the attention of the students by showing some video, it might be ok to use them sparingly. Okay. On the other hand, if we take the yes path, so this is the first question that you are asking, is there anything that is going to change? Okay, so, whenever you want to depict some change, visualization is a good idea. Okay, then you ask the question, okay, what function is that animation serving? Okay, is it presentation or clarification? So, in that case, you find that animation may be useful, but it depends upon the domain. In some domains, it may be useful like for example, the distillation column even though you might be simply operating at the understand level, okay, you might simply be at the lower cognitive levels, it is still a useful thing because you are looking at the internal structure of equipment. And then you move on to asking this question that is animation inherently tied to your subject. So, if the answer is no, then you do not need to go further. Now, if you say okay, look animation is required and look at these three categories. You know. In order to explain a procedure, I am going to use an animation to explain a procedure or I am going to use it to explain a concept or I am going to use it to illustrate some fact principles or rules. Okay, so, these are the three main categories in which we want to think. When we talk about okay, I have a purpose for which for my topic, let us say I want to illustrate the rule of some equation. So, you need to decide whether this falls in the category of illustrating a procedure or whether it falls in the category of a concept or whether the equation is simply a rule. Okay. So, the same equation depending upon what purpose that you want to use may fall in either one of these three categories. So, it does not mean that always equations are rules. So, once you decide that I want my students to be able to 
follow a procedure and the equipment or the context is not readily available. Okay, so, this was the key idea why we saw most of the animations in this session, because the equipment or the context is not readily available. Okay, it is not easy to always show this experiment of you know, iodine and zinc live in every class. So, you capture a video of that. It is not easy to look into the internals of a distillation column. So, you create an animation for that. Okay. So, in this case animation might be useful in explaining the steps of the procedure. Okay. If you come to concepts once again we have to ask the question is there any impact because of simultaneous influences or changes over time or is there something which is not visible to the eye. So, in any of these cases if your answer is yes then once again you will find that an animation is useful to communicate that concept. Okay, if you find that okay, it is a concept, but there is no change over time or there is no microscopic activity that you want to look at, then perhaps again there is no need for a visualization. Okay, so, that is the basic idea of how we go about taking this decision of when to use a visualization versus when we do not want to use the visualization. So, let me just recap here. The first question that you want to ask is, is there any inherent movement in my topic? Okay. If there is no inherent movement, then perhaps your answer is no. Okay. Movement of anything, it need not be movement of the entire object, but it can simply be movement of some internal of the object or movement of even at the molecular level in the object which is important. Then having asked that question, you ask whether is it the procedure that I want the student to learn or is it the concept that I want the student to learn. Okay, and having decided which of these is more appropriate for that particular learning objective, you can go ahead and decide the type of visualization that you need. For example, if you want the student to learn the procedure of how a packet is assembled before it is sent on the network, then a visualization of which simply shows how a sender and a receiver interact with each other is not the appropriate visualization. Even though it may be an accurate visualization, it is not the appropriate one for your chosen objective. So, with that let us just look at one small activity. So, you wrote some learning objectives earlier and for some three of those learning objectives list a pur purpose for which you can use a visualization. So, this is the last slide and if you need I will just go back to the slide of the Weiss graph itself, but essentially the Weiss graph even though you may not want to follow it exactly, you can think of it in terms of a flow chart which is helping you to decide you know, is there any movement and am I illustrating a procedure or am I illustrating a concept. You ask those questions you will more or less be able to arrive at the Weiss graph on your own. So, yeah, also note that this is an extension of your morning's lab because there we talked about one visualization and one learning objective right without thinking about what is the purpose. So, it's and the type of the visualization right without thinking about what is the purpose or the type of the visualization. So, once again I think this type of the visualization is not so critical I do not know why I wrote type of visualization here. Oh, it turns out that this is also an assignment which is already uploaded. So, what I will do is I will pause at the previous slide then and if anybody wants to you know send a response over the chat or ask a question ok I will take 2 3 questions. So, this is Narayana Gurukulam college. Sir I had a question in the previous session sir ok. In Bloom's taxonomy, digital Bloom's taxonomy. Yes. In that, uh, uh, there was a, 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 a level for that Bloom's taxonomy that is create. Yes. Create. Yes, go ahead. What is the question? Uh, in, uh, he has, uh, the teacher has explained that creation is uh, some sort of creation, creating the portfolios and creating video something something and I, I got confused with the create that we have already discussed in the uh, previous uh, uh, the day one class that is the 
Bloom's taxonomy. That is something about uh, changing the figures or creating new ideas or explaining things for a uh, new. Uh, that was the that was what explained in the first day, and uh, today it was something different. So, what is the difference between those? Sir, I I want to know that. Yeah. Okay. So, create. Strictly speaking, create means create something new. You are right in understanding that in the first uh, what you heard in the first day create was described as something uh, which was uh, uh, which something new that has to be created. So, in digital blooms what we find what you will see is that the levels are also converted into learning activities. So, if you want students to create something. So, now creating of a video let us take that as an example would you call that as a create activity or would you call that as an apply activity these questions are also sometimes when we go to the digital blooms taxonomy it can be that what you might think as an apply level activity if we give the correct set of activities it can also become a create activity can you state any software to create technical animations from tools so software for creating animation so there are it depends once again on the purpose so if your purpose is to show you have flash you know you could write java programs or you could also have specific software if you want to create 3d animations so we have blender you have other such uh, tools that are available so a simple google will actually lead you to a set of such tools for creating animations so are there free tools yes many of these tools are free how are they to be used now that is something that you will have to look at the how to of those tools so i mean there are separate workshops which are tool based workshops which will just to teach you how to use python so there is a site called spoken tutorials where you will find a lot of tutorials about use of these tools so even if you google spoken tutorials this is again a project which is being run at iit bombay you will find lot of these uh, tools or tutorials for use of software tools so at this point we'll take a break for tea